The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. But I'm going to give you a message on comfort today. But I'm always torn between comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable. I think we have a greater anointing on afflicting the comfortable. But anyway, whichever way it looks, um, we're going to be blessed this morning. So, Father, we just thank you. I'm going to do part two on uh, the comforter understanding the work of the Holy Spirit. So, Father, we just thank you. You who began a good work in us are going to continue that good work. And part two of the Comforter, um, there's some things that I, I feel uh, started to surface uh, this week. As a matter of fact, even at uh, Sid's, Sid's meeting, it stirred up some thoughts that I never developed. Probably got half thoughts out. Have you ever done that? Got a half thought out, and then God comes back and amplifies it. Actually, that's the way you're supposed to get a sermon. You get the message first, not the sermon. You get the message, and then God, by the Spirit, helps you develop it. All right? Well, here's the word that he gave me. Um, uh, especially um, knowing that we are a prophetic people. You're comfortable with the prophetic. But by and large, what does the prophetic do? The prophetic says... Here's what's going to happen. All right? Here's what we see happening. And <clears throat> when I looked at that, um, I saw that, first of all, my criteria for hearing a prophetic word is uh, the love nature has to be on it, or I kind of put it on a shelf, even if it's temporary, sometimes permanently. But I need to feel that, that Jesus never changed. Even a corrective word should have the love of heaven behind it, right? correct? So I look for, number one, the nature. I want to feel the love of God, the very essence of God, because the devil can quote Scripture. Angry people can quote Scripture. So I want the nature to be on it, first of all, priority. Secondly, it has to be scriptural. Okay? Thirdly, I have a responsibility to respond to the prophetic word by means of I have a conscience. And my conscience is supposed to distinguish, when my heart's right, distinguish between truth and error, right from wrong, you know, holy from unholy, and make that distinction. And then lastly, I want to hear what spiritual authority has to say. Isn't it interesting? In my opinion, spiritual authority is on the bottom. I don't want to burst anybody's authority bubble. <laughs> but in reality, understanding the authority of the Word of God, it must start with the love nature first. It needs to be your relationship with Jesus before uh, Joe Heavy Speaker, even if that's me. And I, my name's not Joe, but even if that's me or Jennifer, ours is not the final say. The final say is always the love of God first, His Word second, your particular conscience Third, then spiritual authority. So, in light of all this, this is what I feel like God's speaking. I've been hearing all of the prophetic words. And one time we were in a meeting uh, doing a book signing. And someone was saying, and I don't know you've all heard this, are we preparing for an awakening? Are we preparing for the glory of God? Come on, just nod your head like a little dog. Yeah. Have you heard anything like that? Okay. But here's my contention. When I look back over my ministry from the day that I got saved, I saw exactly what this one gentleman said. He was preaching, uh, a well-known preacher, and uh, Jennifer and I were there doing a book signing. I think it was Live Free that we were doing at that time. We were doing a book signing for Live Free. And he said, and there's going to be a harvest, a huge, huge harvest of new believers. And we need to get ready for it. And then he had that moment, that epiphany. 
And he looked around and he goes, you could see he was thinking, get ready for it. How do I get ready for it? Uh, maybe you ought to all buy Dennis and Jennifer's book. <laughs> and actually, I believe that that was a truth. Because our anointing has always been not to prophesy what is to come, but how to make ready a people for what comes. And when I look backwards all through my entire Christian experience, it was the job that I had was to make ready a people prepared in light of the consensus of prophetic words. You know, we talk about uh, uh, Samuel, that not a word of prophecy fell to the ground that wasn't fulfilled. Well, that's wonderful, but I don't think there's any prophets out there right now that are operating at that level. So what's the wisest thing you can do? A consensus. What are, what are many of them saying? And then you still have to go, do you feel the love of God? Do you feel a redemptive solution to it? Or is it just a warning and fear-based? Is there a redemptive solution? Redemption is the name of the game, and it's never going to change. Jesus is about redemption. So he's not going to just scare people and warn them with no solution. Like, I don't know what to do. These people are crazy, you know. That, you know that's not right. So what I feel like God is basically saying right now is that how many are familiar with an Old Testament scripture, 1 Chronicles 12, 32? When I look back over my entire life, the part that I am the most pleased with was that when I had an ear to hear what the prophetic voices were saying, you know, like a consensus, I would ask God, now how do I prepare my people in light of that? I don't think there's actually enough of that. I think there's way too much what God is going to do, but a minimal amount of information coming out, what do we do about it? It's like knowledge is wonderful, but wisdom is the application of knowledge. I think wisdom is the principal thing. And so uh, I look back, and I'm not saying this in a, in a bragging kind of way, but I think what, we, what we've had given to us, you know, we know in part, we prophesy in part, but I think we have an Issachar anointing. And, and I think if we're going to be a blessing to the body of Christ, Jennifer and I, it's the Issachar anointing. It's how to make ready a people prepared for what's coming. It's, it's one thing for John the Baptist to go say, repent, repent, repent. It's, uh, and I've often wondered, John the Baptist saying, repent, repent, repent. He was sent with a strategic message, a prophetic message, to turn hearts from the fathers to the children, the children to the fathers. There was a turning. There's never been a move of God without repentance, historically. So it's not going to change. There's going to be a cleaning up. Judgment's going to begin at the house of God. It's going to start with you cleaning up your act and taking things that you thought were harmless and taking them seriously and say, I need cleansed and washed of that. I need the love of God to just bathe me. With a, with a baptism of love. I need to be like in 2 uh, uh, Corinthians 5 where it says, the love of God constraineth me or controls me. The love of God, here's another definition. The love of God is pressing me on all sides, eliminating any other option. I'd say that'd be a love walk, wouldn't it? The love of God is pressing me on all sides, eliminating any other option. Wow, if we walked in that kind of love realm, uh, longing for that dimension of being pressed in a good way, controlled by the love of God. Wow, let the peace of God rule. I like that. But anyway, this First Chronicles 12.32 says that the tribe of Issachar were those who understood the times and knew what Israel ought to do. That was their gift. They, did, they, weren't, they didn't have to have a lot of other gifts. I don't think we need to have a lot of other gifts. What we need to do is to operate in the one he's given us. And what God's given us is how to make ready a people prepared. Luke 117 is basically our hallmark. First of all, it's that we might know him, that we might progressively become more intimately acquainted with him. And after doing that, make ready a people prepared for what the prophetic voices are saying. And I'm convinced that one of the things that we need to do is we need to write a book on gossip because it is both a cancer, <laughs> murder, because it's character assassination, and 
it's always got a seducing spirit attached to it. You know, you don't sin unless there's a tickle. You don't sin because you want to feel fearful, guilty, or ashamed, do you? You want something that has a pleasant feeling to it, a lustful feeling. Matter of fact, you couldn't even go fishing unless the bait had an attraction to it. You're not going to catch nothing without an attraction. So there has to be an attraction to it. A seducing spirit is just that. <clears throat> it can be doctrines. It can be sexual. It can be gossip. It can be a person that wants to give a word that comes against someone else. It says, the words of a gossip. Uh, King James, I think, says talebearer. You know what that is. It's a gossip. The words of a gossip are like tasty morsels. That means, mm, it's kind of like I want it. Mm. It's like commercials are geared toward that lust, aren't they? You deserve a break today. You need to get away. No offense, McDonald's, but... Uh, <laughs> But it's to incite a, ooh, I want to. But it says the words of a gossip are like tasty morsels that go down into the innermost rooms of the belly. And it, it goes down as tasty morsels. One translation says wounds. Mm. So I want you to get a visual of this. You tolerate and you listen to gossip. And it'll tickle. And so you'll want You'll get momentarily a little bit excited. You might just call it interested. All right? And when it comes in, it goes, it goes down as a wound. And if it's like, oh, Jennifer didn't do such and such. Whenever you would then see Jennifer, hypothetically, there's a wound down here. It's not a pure heart. To have the eyes of Jesus, you have to have the heart of Jesus. But what if you've got a wound down here and you, about Jennifer and then you see Jennifer? You are going to see with your eyes a vision, a distorted vision based on the wounding. That's good. That's very good. And my favorite story is when Jennifer was a baby Christian, she joined an intercession group in an assemblies church down in Georgia. And <clears throat> she's brand new, and she's hungering after the things of God. And, yeah, I want to go to the prayer meeting. I'm going to do intercession. And the pastor said, and those ladies doing intercession are nothing but doing witchcraft. And she was, like, humiliated as a baby Christian. You know, that's a wound, right? And it hurt. And she dealt with it between her and God instead of running and telling everybody. And her unsaved husband, who at that time said, you go get religious on me and I'll divorce you. She did anyway, but... And, <laughs> and, and he remained unsaved, but she remembered that, you know, I'm just going to pray for that man. And by the way, later on, he got a little more up to speed and found out that intercession was something that was uh, a, a benefit to the church that it wasn't witchcraft. I think he was afraid of losing control or somehow they were taking over or doing something. He didn't know what they were doing, but he really didn't understand it. But as a pastor, he later changed his mind and saw the benefit of it. But that didn't stop what you felt like sitting in a congregation being called a witch, did it? Well, anyway, years passed by. Jennifer's late husband was a medical doctor, but he got cancer, terminal cancer. And he was in Emory in Atlanta Hospital. That pastor that called them witches for being in intercession got a word from God to drive up all the way from South Georgia all the way up to Emory in Atlanta to drive up to see Jennifer's late husband. And he led him to the Lord. A man who was hardened against God was open to the Lord. Now, here's my thought. What if, as an unsaved man, Jennifer went and said, you know what that pastor said? Do you know what he called us witches? Do you think he would have been as open to that man to receive salvation? Or would he see that man 
based on the word of gossip that he heard. I think right now, before we get any further, I think you, we all need to repent of anything. The only time it's not gossip, otherwise we'd have to eliminate all counselors, <laughs> is when you're part of the problem or part of the solution. But if it's none of your business and it's not in your jurisdiction, it's none of your business. I have to hear stuff as a leader to know how to negotiate in, in circumstances with people. But if it's not in my jurisdiction, I could care less. I don't need to know. And I don't want to hear it because the, the, the problem is not just the giver of the information, but the receiver. And if you've read in Hebrews 12, 15, a bitter root springs up, causes you trouble, and defiles others. So it not only causes you trouble with a wound, you're going to pass that wound on. You will defile other people. You think this is a serious message? How many believe that Jennifer should write a booklet on this? Hmm? Because to make ready a people prepared for a harvest, I can still remember uh, th that one preacher says, you people are calling for the glory, the glory, the glory. If the glory came, half of you would end up dead, like Ananias and Sapphira, because you don't call sin, sin anymore. Don't be asking for something you don't, you know, you don't know what it is. And I'm saying probably the most important work that we've done through the years was to make ready a people prepared in light of what was going on. And I can go all the way back, and I'm not going to bore you with that, but from the time that I got saved, every time I obeyed God with what he was telling me to do, whether I understood the whole thing or not, it was to prepare for what God was doing at that point in time. I took a tremendous beat, beating from cult researchers when I decided to have prophecy in my church. I took a beating from people, but God told me to do it. I had four different dance teams, and I got beat up by some religious people for dancing in church. How dare you? I got beat up for having uh, prophecy, dance, uh, but all of it was to make ready a people prepared for what was coming. And quite frankly, after it started to get established, like a pioneer, God would move me on to another emphasis. And even now, the emphasis, you don't see a, a lot of flags, banners, um, four dance teams, four worship teams, all of that. All of that was for a time and a season. The prophetic, the children were trained in the prophetic, but guess what? The prophetic's been around now since the 70s. What God is saying is, and everyone's saying, there's going to be a huge harvest. And just what are you going to do with them? Amen. And I'm telling you what it is. Our next book, which will be out August 18th, at least that's what it says on Amazon. August 18th, we should have them before them. But it's on the ancient blueprint. It includes the teachings of the Didache, what the early church did as Jewish apostles who had a background of Ten Commandments. They had the Old Testament. They knew right from wrong. Come on. Even without Jesus, they knew right from wrong. And then they come into an experience with Jesus. They've got a foundation. They saw Jesus in the Old Testament. But you had Gentiles that had, well, I got the God Diana. We got the God uh, you know, this God and that God, we got 20 gods. Uh, if we have a baby girl and we don't want girls, we just put them out in the cold and let them die. So now these people get saved. We need an Issachar anointing, don't we? Because if that happened right now, the people in the world, and even some in the church, have been so thoroughly indoctrinated that they are going to have to start from scratch between this is right, this is wrong. The Didache was written, and our last book was written, to take people who have no foundation and give them a starting place, to make ready a people prepared for what's coming. Remember, that was the statement that that preacher made. He goes, Bob Jones's prophecy that there'd be a billion soul harvest. Okay. And what is the church going to do with a billion soul harvest, most of which were not raised in the church? Where are you going to start with them? How did the Didache start? 
There's two ways to live. There's the way of life and the way of death, and great is the chasm between the two. You're going to have to start there, aren't you? I don't care what you've been raised with. I don't care what you call normal. I don't care what all your friends are doing. There is a way that leads to life, and there's a way that leads to death, because they will use that. Well, all my friends, well, all my friends, maybe you need to get some new friends, because that, those, early, those early disciples, when they became believers, suddenly they lost family, they were ridiculed, they were isolated. Just like when I was a young pastor and had prophecy in the church. You're going to pay a price. And these people need to know what is right and what is wrong and not water it down because culture has accepted this. See, I believe that we can draw so close to the Lord in our discipleship. That's what's going to be necessary. That's going to be the word of the Lord as far as what do we do. You're going to have to learn how to disciple somebody from scratch. And do not assume they have a value standard. Those Gentiles, they may have experienced God instantly, supernaturally, but then all of a sudden they needed mentor. They needed mother and father. And I believe it's going to be the older generation that's going to help them. But the main thing is, is not, not to baby them, not to pamper them, but to teach them what they need to know in order to stand on their own two feet and make something of their life. The tribe of Issachar, 1 Chronicles 12, 32, understood the times and knew what Israel ought to do. One of the first things when we talk about, I was just talking with somebody recently, and they're, they're, they're training people, even people have been in the church for a long time, how to get their life put back together again. And they say, what's the, I said, so what's the first thing that you have to tell somebody? And they go, location, location, location. The bulk of the church doesn't know that their spirit is here. They think it's here. They think their will is here instead of the door of the heart. Jesus didn't stand at your head and knock and say, can I come in your head? But he didn't come in your blood pumper either. It's going to be location. It's going to be like real estate, really. <laughs> location, although they say that's not really true, but location, location, location is still important. How about your real estate people, right? It's still important. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, how much more in the spiritual anatomy of an individual? If you don't know where your parts are, <laughs> you're going to have trouble using parts you don't know how they operate and where they are at. So, but God is basically saying that I'm going to teach a people how to draw close to me. And here's your mission. Here's your how-to. I always said, mine is not to be a, a prophetic voice to tell you what's going to happen. Mine is a voice to say what to do in light of what's going to happen. All right? And you're going to have to learn to comfort people. Yep. And it's mandated. Matter of fact, three prevailing scriptures in the Old Testament. And I found this, we had uh, Bill Morford who wrote the One New Man Bible. He was in our church when we had a church plant in Columbia, South Carolina. And he discovered in his research all the double I am's. I am, I am. You come across those in scripture. There's like 30 some. I am, I am. But he said there's three I am's, double I am's, that were more intense. That would be one way to say it. More intense than all the other ones. Isaiah 43, 11. This is for the benefit of note takers. Isaiah 43, 25. And Isaiah 51, 12. And these were a passionate declaration from the heart of the Father toward us us toward believers he said and you could get a whole message just out of these three i am's if these are not just and a matter of fact in the hebrew this is for the scholars that i'm not but i did remember he said this i am i am is ani ani and all 30 some are ani ani i am i am and whenever it's doubled it means i'm emphasizing a point here just like when jesus said truly truly that means 
you need to really pay attention because <laughs> I'm not doubling it just for the point of exaggeration here. I'm doubling it for emphasis. But then those three that I just enumerated in Isaiah are anohi anohi, which means I am, I am emphasizing it, and I really mean this, like he doesn't mean the rest of it, but it's like I really mean this with a great intensity. And, get, and guess what the first one is? I am, I am your Savior, and no one else can save you. How would that help a new believer? So much for many ways to God? Or many gods? <laughs> I am, I am your Savior. Some translations say deliverer, and no one else can deliver you. No one else can save you. The second one, I am, I am the God who removes your transgressions. I am, I am your forgiver. And apart from me, there's no forgiveness. Apart from me, there's no remission of sin. Apart from me, there's no cleansing. You will die in your sin. But the last one, God has surfaced in this last week that says to make ready a people prepared, there's going to be an emphasis on this last one because it's not being done. I am, I am your comforter, and everything apart from him is a false comfort. I am, I am your comforter. And I said, if we were to translate that and say, God is preaching this word at me, just like I'm preaching it to you, I am, I am. If my response was a godly response, what would it look like? What would I look like if I obeyed those three commands? I am, I am your savior and there's none. You know, I am your deliverer. You know what that would be? If that impacted me the way it should impact me, I would be a solution-oriented, redemptive-oriented person. I'd have the same heart that my father has. I want to see people saved, changed lives, transformed. I want to see them delivered out of the mess they're in, out of the muck and mire, and see the gold that's in them, and then encourage that gold to be developed in them. We should be gold miners if you really had that same heart. I am. I am your deliverer. He's not delivering us just for the sake of delivering us. He's not putting notches on his gun like he's accomplished something. He's delivering you so that you can fulfill the purpose for which you were ordained. He sees you the way Jesus sees you, and he wants you to see yourself the way he sees you. Not your flesh, but the gold within that can be cultivated. The second one, I am, I am the God who forgives you your sin. If I let that impact me properly, what would I be as a son of, the, of a loving father? I would be a forgiver. Forgiveness would be as easy to flow from me as, as water, uh, water flowing down a river. We are the most forgiven people on the face of the earth. We should be the most forgiving people on the face of the earth. Hardness of heart, unforgiveness in the heart, what a contradiction to the way God is and what he's called us to be. And get a good definition of forgiveness because I've seen people in the church 20 years and they still can't define it properly. Nonetheless, they certainly can't do it yet because it has to, unless you forgive from the heart. You forgive from the head and live with the pain, I've heard people say. That's not forgiveness. That's mental assent. It has nothing to do with Jesus or the Spirit. If you don't forgive from the heart. How do I know if I forgave from the heart? Peace. If it doesn't change the peace. If you say, I forgive that person, but I still feel angry inside. You did not forgive. You may have been sincere, but you're sincerely wrong. You need a supernatural transaction. A supernatural exchange. But here's the last one. This is the message. This is all introduction. I am, I am your comforter, and everything else is a false comfort. 
And I want to pray this, and for those watching, I think this needs to be your homework because this is serious. Just as much as we need to recognize gossip and its potential damage to undo what God is building, we need to understand false comfort versus real comfort. There's only re one real comforter. Everything else is a false comfort, and who is that? It's the Holy Spirit, and that's His name. His name and His nature match. Matter of fact, you know, demons are like that. Their name and their nature matches. You don't have to go, what's your name, demon? Actually, watch by its manifestation, it, de it declares itself. Seducing spirit wants to tickle you into sin. Sexual sin, gossip sin, overeating sin, shopping sin, he don't care. If he can tickle you into it, then you can feel guilty and ashamed later. Most people deal with their guilt and their shame, but they do not deal with the initial lust attachment. And you'll struggle the rest of your life asking for forgiveness over and over for something that really you needed to deal with where it gave, you gave place to it. Remember the devil, uh, Jesus said the devil's coming, but he has nothing in me. He doesn't have a hook in me. The tickle is a hook, and I want to cover that. Let's cover the false comforts before we see, because here's the mandate. Here's where we're going with this. I'm going to give you the end first. Comfort ye, comfort my people, the scripture says. But in 2 uh, Corinthians it says, comfort others with the same comfort you were comforted with during your time of affliction. We're in a time, culturally even, of testing. If you respond to this testing properly, you're going to walk on a Holy Ghost anointing to truly comfort somebody. Because the false comfort is, uh, I'm bummed out and afraid, so I'm going to hug somebody who's bummed out and afraid. And, uh, no, that's, that's identification. Did you know there's no anointing going to that person? You're afraid, they're afraid. Probably the only thing that's going is fear is being fortified. That is not ministry. I've seen more people call ministry identification. Oh, when a person's hurting in rejection, they see someone else that's rejected, they go, oh, who the, pray for you. Well, you know what? First get healed up yourself and give some anointing <laughs> instead of just identification. Does that make sense? But here's what the Lord showed me. We're call, he's calling the church to comfort them with the same comfort that you've been comforted during your time of testing. All right, we've been in a time of testing. When you respond right, who comforts you? Holy Spirit, and that is name, the comforter. When you can have peace regardless of people and circumstances, you're in victory. If you don't have peace in the midst of people and circumstances, you're avoiding the comforter. And this actually, a few weeks ago, I told Jennifer, I, I'm not a crier, but I sobbed uh, in, in prayer thinking about all the people that I've seen come and go, especially as a pastor. You know, you, you know it too as friends. Haven't you seen some friends come and go? And da, 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 da. I see church people, oh, pastor, we're here. We're part of you. And most of the time, that's because uh, I want to get something, so I show up two times and then want to make an appointment. You know, No, that's a user. That's not someone who's committing to participate, to be a giver. And they would say, uh, uh, I'm with you. And no matter how many years you've been in ministry, when all of a sudden, and a lot of times you don't even know what it was, they got a bee in their bonnet, and they just leave. And, oh, my favorite one is, God told me. You know, you know what you could do with that? Uh, God told you, yeah. All right. And how sad it used to be, even as a young pastor, to watch the little kids. I had 60, my first pastor was 60 some kids, uh, ages uh, from K through 12. And to make ready a people prepared, you know what we did in that day? 60 some kids. I had a woman who's now pastoring in my old building, really, who could break down my sermons from kindergarten through grade school. That's a gift, isn't it? And you know what it did? It, pro it produced a one accord 
it produced something beautiful, it produced a family. It produced people who were on the same page. Can you imagine a kindergartner? Can you imagine taking this message today and bringing it to a kindergartner? You could. You could. You just break it down to their level. Many books are written at third to fifth grade level. Quite frankly, that's what the publishers want. It's kind of sad, but it's the way it is. But you're without an excuse saying, I don't understand. <laughs> so God was saying, to, I forgot where I was going with that one. What was the last thing I said? I sobbed because I was seeing how the people come and go. And when I was saved as a young Catholic, I had a lot of Catholic friends. I had genuine conversion experiences. And they loved God, but they didn't want to move on. And I remember how sad that was. Huh? You, there, nobody was mad at anybody, but they just didn't want to pursue God any further than where they were at. Some of them were going to change the Catholic Church. Then there was the little kids that all of a sudden, some, you know, Aunt Sally got a bee in her bonnet, and the little kids were attached to those Sunday school teachers, and they're going, Mommy, Daddy, where's Aunt Sally? What do you tell the kid? Oh, Aunt Sally's got a bee in her bonnet, and she went somewhere else. <laughs> Because they didn't know how to resolve their differences through forgiveness. They didn't know how to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of God. And most people don't. Most people run from their issues rather than deal with their issues. This is a hard church to go to. I recommend you not come to this church unless you're serious. Because we won't play games and we won't baby you. Has anyone felt babied while you've been here? No, of course not. Because the, the whole goal of the ministry is stand on your own two feet. You deal with it. I can remember one time, a lady, she lasted about a month. She came forward, we had altar ministry, and I said, here, put your hand down here, we're going to go to Jesus, the Jesus in you. The Jesus in me, I came here for you to minister to me. <laughs> she only said out loud what some people think. Huh? She just really, but guess what? We're going to learn you a different way, because I'm not going to be that, your beck and call 24-7, nor is my staff. You're going to have to learn the material and learn how to relate to people on a more mature level. And it's called standing on your own two feet. You're going to be an accountability, an accountability to deal with your stuff. Not, uh, like I shared this with the, with the staff uh, at another ministry. You know, it's, it's not, oh, how many times have we heard this? You have home groups. Oh, good, I have a safe place to dump. No. No. We don't accept dump. Don't come if you're going to dump on somebody else. You know what it's a safe place for you? For you to deal and be accountable for you. You and you alone. Is that too hard? God's telling me to make ready a people prepared, Dennis. You stick to that, your story, whether no one likes it or not. And I will. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. You deal with your stuff. You don't deal with someone else. So every time you badmouth somebody else, you're basically poisoning the body. It's causing you trouble, and it defiles other people. And I've never seen it accomplish anything. How many say, I ain't going to that house group? <laughs> But you know, it can be the healthiest thing you've ever experienced if you could be honest. Hmm? We have an orientation group. We don't accept people without going through orientation. Orientation explains all of that. That's why we don't have outreach house groups. You know why? Because they will then in turn make it exactly like what they're accustomed to. Fellowship. Have fellowship on your own time and reach out. That's the healthy way. But fellowship is not the purpose alone. When John Wesley changed the nation, it was because he discipled. This is what God is telling Jennifer and I. We're disciplers. If you just want fun and games and fellowship, go somewhere else, really. But he discipled and changed the nation. But when it came to America, they skipped the accountability and had prayer groups and Bible studies. Uh-oh. But here's the mandate that God's given for this church. 
wherever in a time of testing, like it's going on in this society right now, you're being tested whether you know it or not, each one in your own way perhaps. But in this time of testing, if you draw closer to that friend, Jesus, this is what made me weep, is that with all the coming and going, with all the people, all the betrayals, all the hurts, all the woundings, all the people you had to pray through, all the people you had to bless them that curse you, pray for them. I've done all of those things. But at the same time, what really melted my heart is I've got a friend that sticks closer than a brother, and he's the comforter, and he never leaves nor he forsakes you. So you can't say, but you don't understand, Pastor, I'm single. It doesn't matter. You and him are a team. You don't need a flesh and blood person to be as perfect as the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit will be there with people change, people come and go, someone to be with the Lord that were friends of mine some backslid into oblivion. But Jesus never left. You have that comforter. But in times of testing, you have to receive comfort. Now, now I want to mess with you a little bit. This has all been easy, right? This has all been easy stuff. Here is a list of legitimate activities. Ask yourself, Holy Spirit, search me. Am I substituting any of these legitimate activities, what kind of activities? Legitimate as a false comfort. Uh-oh. Because the mandate God gave me was comfort. This is what's coming for the church, to teach you to comfort them with the same comfort He comforted you during your time of testing. Assuming you pass the test, you get comforted then you have something that you could actually give somebody that's anointed instead of just words or advice. You want to give anointing. You have an anointing that abides within, you want to give anointing. But you can't give something you never received. Comfort them with the same comfort whereby you were comforted in your time of affliction. Now, here is what we do. That's Jeremiah 2.13, by the way. It says, My people have committed two evils, they have forsaken me, the fountain. They didn't, they didn't go to me. And they found substitutes. They've hewn for themselves cisterns. Here, in my experience in ministry, are some of the common cisterns. Willpower, pushy, try harder. Trying harder can be a substitute for getting the comfort from the Holy Spirit in a time of testing. Unhealthy relationships. They make me feel better. <laughs> Some people even feel spiritually, they like hanging around with unspiritual people that makes them feel spiritual. Don't, uh, don't ask me. Possessions. Got to go play with my boat. Hobbies. Hobbies. I don't know how to deal with the pressure, so I do what? Shop. <laughs> I don't know how to deal with the pressure. I'm anxious. I'm isolated. I'm at home. I feel like I have no freedom. I'm going to eat. <laughs> food. Is food legitimate? Are hobbies legitimate? Yeah, these are legitimate. What, you're, what God is to make ready of people prepared that are going to be able to stand with the joy of the Lord Regardless of people and regardless of circumstances, you're going to have to learn what are false comforts. I want the real thing. I want the comforter. I want the friend of the Holy Spirit that never leaves. I have to leave Him. I have to walk away and, and reject the Holy Spirit. And these are false comforts. Are they legitimate? I already said that. Shopping, drugs, alcohol, sex, money, job, Career, titles, position, family, sports, fantasy, vacations, travel, entertainment. I've had to deal with people that were in fantasy that it was really not much different than pornography. You can have a make-believe world and it's not a God thing. It's something you concocted to soothe yourself to comfort, to self-medicate. 
All right, if you got beat up enough, those of you who are watching by YouTube, these people already do this proficiently, but I'm sure you need this, all right? Let's repent. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to make ready a people prepared. Show me anything that may be legitimate in and of itself, but in times of testing, I gravitate toward it rather than the Holy Spirit. Is that fair enough? That's simple enough? Father, right now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm opening my heart to be searched. God searched, not man searched. God searched. Search me, O oh God, for any anxious thoughts, hurtful ways, any false comforts, anything I use to self-medicate, any legitimate thing that is legitimate in and of itself, but I use it to self-medicate. I'm receiving the I am, I am, the one that forgives you. I am, I am, receiving cleansing. I'm seeing, I'm seeing a lot of people using food even during this time of isolation as a comfort. It's a false comfort. It makes you momentarily feel good, but there's, a, there's, a, there's going to be great deliverance right here. Those of you who are watching by YouTube, there's going to be a deliverance from food addictions right now in the name of Jesus. I receive it, the cleansing, and that, 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 that actually the excitement or the titillation that comes with wanting to go and have food, to go have it. I'm not talking about hunger. That's a natural appetite. I'm talking about the excitement that need to make me feel better. You know, they call it comfort food, let's face it. I receive forgiveness for any false comforts, hobbies, titles, jobs. I receive forgiveness. Now here's where we get into the solution. I receive forgiveness for the false comfort. And now I'm receiving the comfort of the Holy Spirit to fill that vacancy in my heart. I am a God-welcoming person, welcoming God to fill that craving where that craving was. I have crucified it. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but this new creation, me, that's being satisfied in Jesus' name. Now, God is speaking to make ready a people prepared. And I want to give you a picture of the, of the way the process works with false comfort so that we can have the comfort of the Holy Spirit regardless of what the craziness that's going on in your life, in your job, in your church, in your home, in your family, in your neighborhood, regardless to, to, to get you to the point where you are actually a, a conduit of comfort that you're going to be able to minister comfort to them. That's your responsibility. You've been called to a ministry of reconciliation, but you can't give somebody something you yourself don't have. Fearful people are of absolutely of no value to someone else. As a matter of fact, you might even be defiling them with your fear. But Madame Guyon had a complicated term. She called it the law of central tendency. We call it drop down. <laughs> That's a lot easier, right? In duo, to drop down and over. The law of central tendency, but here's the picture. And this is to make ready a people prepared that are really going to mature in the things of God. The picture of the Father, and many need this image, the Father and the prodigal who went off. Did you notice the, product, the Father didn't chase after? Did you notice that? Because most people think that the job of the father should have been to run after. No. But the father was always hoping, watching, waiting, loving, yearning. So much so, but what did it take? It took a turning on the part of the person. You can't make somebody a Christian. You can't make somebody change. That's witchcraft. You do not make someone else change. But when he came to you pray for them to push away the powers of darkness from around them so that they can make a free will decision, and when they come to themselves, and much of that was your intercessory prayer. It's not like you do nothing, but you can't control. He came to himself 
he did what? What does the story say? He started walking home. But the father who saw him from afar off ran to him. There is a principle in there that you need to understand. The law of central tendency is like gravity. Instead of getting controlled by people and circumstances, you go to Jesus. When you drop down to Jesus, it's like gravity. He runs toward you. Scripture says, draw nigh to God, and He draws nigh to you. He's doing the running. You're merely turning. You're merely turning. You're merely repenting. You're merely changing your heart and wanting to. But when you open up, the gravity of God reaching for you is far more intense than any activity you could do. For it is God who is at work to will and to do. Who's doing the willing? Who's doing the... You turn and let go and let God. But God, like gravity, will draw with great intensity. The law of central tendency means he's, you draw near to God. All you've got to do is turn to him and he does it. When it comes to forgiveness, all you do is you open your heart and guess what? It pours out. Out of your belly flows a river. It's like turning on a spigot. You don't have to make the water come out. <laughs> all you need to do is open the door. And it flows, anointing. You can fool people with your words and you can fool them with your gestures, but you can't hide what emanates because all of you, no matter how, what kind of a facade you might put on, you emanate something. A flavor, if you want to call it that. But God is the giver of comfort. His word is comfort. He's the Holy Spirit. He's better that I go, Jesus said, that I could send the comforter to you. But if you don't take advantage of that relationship, you will find a false comfort. And I believe that what God's saying is there's going to be a huge harvest. But I want people that are anointed enough to give them something besides information. I want them to give them something besides a prophetic word. I want you to give them a strategy on how to live their life. I love that Didache, those early uh, Jewish apostles, they taught these Gentiles and said, you know, your mother or father could bring you into this world, but it's going to be your mentor that's going to teach you how to live in this world. And that's really what, what fivefold ministers are supposed to be doing, but that's also what you're supposed to be doing because he called you to go and make disciples, not just converts, disciples. That means you teach them how to do it themselves rather than doing it for them. How many parents have made that mistake already? Don't raise your hand where you did for the kid rather than teaching the kid what the responsible action is. Hmm? And how many have tried to live their life through their children to be what they didn't do? What if your child doesn't want to do that? <laughs> right? Let them be. They are uniquely loved by God. Let them be unique. They don't need to be fashioned or molded after your, your vision of what they should be like, and it goes with husbands and wives. You don't fashion that man into the vision of what you want, and he doesn't fashion you into that woman he wants. We won't go there today. We'll save that one. How many want the real comfort? How many could see false comforts that during this time of testing you lean toward? I'll tell you what, we, we get cleansed of that. It's going to create a greater capacity for you to stand strong regardless of people and, cir people and circumstances. That's, uh, what is that, Colossians 1? Being steadfast, listen to this, being steadfast, patient, st steadfast in circumstances, patient with people with joy. You know what that is? All of life. People, uh, is there something besides people and circumstances? <laughs> I don't know, people and circumstances, to be steadfast and patient with joy. That's supernatural. But you're going to have to allow God to show you the false comforts. So, Father, we ask you right now by the power of the Holy Spirit that we're going to have an entire congregation that is going to be used in the days ahead to comfort people with the anointing of God and not just words, not just sentiment but actually comfort them by giving them the God tools to stand on their own two feet and accomplish the purposes of God, to make ready a people prepared. And so, Father, may that Issachar anointing be transferred even to each and every one in this congregation. If you were called to this body, that's our primary anointing, discipleship. 
Our primary anointing is not to be what the prophetic word is, but how to respond to the prophetic word. That's far, far more important for us as our ministry develops. Make sure you get the, the, the dedicate when it comes out at August 18th, or at least that's what Amazon says. So, Father, seal this work right now by the power of the Holy Spirit, and enjoy yourself. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.